abstractedly up and down the cave, without having the least regard to the riches that were around him. About noon the robbers visited their cave. At some distance they saw Cassim's mules straggling about the rock, with great chests on their backs. Alarmed at this, they galloped full speed to the cave. They drove away the mules, which strayed through the forest so far that they were soon out of sight, and went directly, with their naked sabres in their hands, to the door, which, on their captain pronouncing the proper words, immediately opened. Cassim, who heard the noise of the horse's feet, at once guessed the arrival of the robbers, and resolved to make one effort for his life. He rushed to the door, and no sooner saw the door open than he ran out and threw the leader down could not escape the other robbers, who, with their scimitars, soon deprived him of life. The first care of the robbers after this was to examine the cave. They found all the bags which Cassim had brought to the door to be ready to load his mules, and carried them again to their places. But they did not miss what Ali Baba had taken away before. Then, holding a council and deliberating upon this occurrence, they guessed that Cassim, when he was in, could not get out again, but could not imagine how he had learned the secret words by which alone he could enter. They could not deny the fact of his being there, and to terrify any person or accomplice who should attempt the same thing, they agreed to cut Cassim's body into four quarters, to hang two on one side and two on the other within the door of the cave. They had no sooner taken this resolution than they put it in execution, and when they had nothing more to detain them, left the place of their hordes well closed. They mounted their horses, went to beat the roads again, and to attack the caravans they might meet. In the meantime, Cassim's wife was very uneasy when night came, and her husband was not returned. She ran to Ali Baba in great alarm, and said, "'I believe, brother-in-law, that you know Cassim is gone to the forest, and upon what count. It is now night, and he has not returned. I am afraid some misfortune has happened to him. Ali Baba told her she need not frighten herself, for that certainly Cassim would not think it proper to come into the town till the night should be pretty far advanced. Cassim's wife, considering how much it concerned her husband to keep the business secret, was the more easily persuaded to believe her brother-in-law. She went home again and waited patiently till midnight. Then her fear redoubled, and her grief was the more sensible because she was forced to keep it to herself. She repented of her foolish curiosity and cursed her desire of prying into the affairs of her brother and sister-in-law. She spent all the night in weeping, and as soon as it was day went to them, telling them by her tears the cause of her coming. Ali Baba did not wait for his sister-in-law to desire him to go to see what was become of Cassim, but departed immediately with his three asses, begging of her first to moderate her affliction. He went to the forest, and when he came near the rock, having seen neither his brother nor the mules in his way, was seriously alarmed at finding some blood spilt near the door, which he took for an ill omen. But when he had pronounced the word and the door had opened, he was struck with horror at the dismal sight of his brother's body. He was not long in determining how he should pay the last dues to his brother, but without adverting to the little fraternal affection he had shown for him, went into the cave to find something to enshroud his remains, and having loaded one of his asses with them, covered them over with wood. The other two asses he loaded with bags of gold, covering them with wood also as before, and then bidding the door shut came away, but was so cautious as to stop some time at the end of the forest that he might not go into town before night. When he came home, he drove the two asses loaded with gold into his little yard, and left the care of unloading them to his wife, while he led the other to his sister-in-law's house. Ali Baba knocked at the door, which was opened by Morgiana, a clever, intelligent slave, who was fruitful in inventions to meet the most difficult circumstances. When he came into the court, he unloaded the ass, and taking Morgiana aside, said to her, "'You must observe an inviolable secrecy. Your master's body is contained in these two panniers. We must bury him as if he had died a natural death. Go now, and tell your mistress. 
I leave the matter to your wit and skillful devices. Ali Baba helped to place the body in Cassim's house, again recommended to Morgiana to act her part well, and then returned with his ass. Morgiana went out early the next morning to a druggist, and asked for a sort of lozenge which was considered efficacious in the most dangerous disorders. The apothecary inquired who was ill. She replied, with a sigh, her good master Cassim himself, and that he could neither eat nor speak. In the evening Morgiana went to the same druggist again, and with tears in her eyes asked for an essence which they used to give to sick people only when at the last extremity. Alas, said she, taking it from the apothecary, I am afraid this remedy will have no better effect than the lozenges, and that I shall lose my good master. On the other hand, as Ali Baba and his wife were often seen to go between Cassim's and their own house all that day, and to see melancholy, nobody was surprised in the evening to hear the lamentable shrieks and cries of Cassim's wife and Morgiana, who gave out everywhere that her master was dead. The next morning, at daybreak, Morgiana went to an old cobbler whom she knew to be always early at his stall, and bidding him good morrow, put a piece of gold into his hand, saying, "'Baba Mustafa, you must bring with you your sewing-tackle and come with me, but I must tell you, I shall blindfold you when you come to such a place.' Baba Mustafa seemed to hesitate a little at these words. "'Oh, oh,' replied he, "'you would have me do something against my conscience, or against my honour. Oh, "'God forbid,' said Morgiana, putting another piece of gold into his hand, "'that I should ask anything that is contrary to your honour. "'Only oh, come along with me, and fear nothing.' Baba Mustafa went with Morgiana, who, after she had bound his eyes with a handkerchief at the place she had mentioned, conveyed him to her deceased master's house, and never unloosened his eyes till he had entered the room where she had put the corpse together. "'Baba Mustafa,' said she, "'you must make haste, and sew the parts of this body together, and when you have done, I will give you another piece of gold.' After Baba Mustafa had finished his task, she blindfolded him again, gave him the third piece of gold as she promised, and recommending secrecy to him, carried him back to the place where she first bound his eyes, pulled off the bandage, and let him go home. But watch him, that he returned toward his stall, till he was quite out of sight, for fear he should have the curiosity to return and dodge her. She then went home. Morgiana, on her return, warmed some water to wash the body, and at the same time Ali Baba perfumed it with incense, and wrapped it in the burying cloths with the accustomed ceremonies. Not long after, the proper officer bought the beer, and when the attendants of the mosque, whose business it was to wash the dead, offered to perform their duty, she told them that it was done already. Shortly after this, the imam and the other ministers of the mosque arrived. Four neighbors carried the corpse to the burying ground, following the imam, who recited some prayers. Ali Baba came after with some neighbors, who often relieved the others in carrying the beer to the burying ground. Morgiana, a slave to the deceased, followed in the procession, weeping, beating her breast, and tearing her hair. Cassim's wife stayed home mourning, uttering lamentable cries with the women of the neighborhood who came, according to custom, during the funeral, and joining their lamentations with hers filled the quarter far and near with sounds of sorrow. In this manner, Cassim's melancholy death was concealed and hushed up between Ali Baba, his widow, and Morgiana, his slave, with so much contrivance that nobody in the city had the least knowledge or suspicion of the cause of it. Three or four days after the funeral, Ali Baba removed his few goods openly to his sister-in-law's house, in which it was agreed that he should in future live. But the money he had taken from the robbers he conveyed thither by night. As for Cassim's warehouse, he entrusted it entirely to the management of his eldest son. While these things were being done, the forty robbers again visited their retreat in the forest. Great, then, was their surprise to find Cassim's body taken away with some of their bags of gold. "'We are certainly discovered,' said the captain. 
the removal of the body and the loss of some of our money plainly shows that the man we killed had an accomplice and for our own lives sake we must try and find him what say you my lads all the robbers unanimously approved of the captain's proposal well said the captain one of you the boldest and most skilful among you must go into the town disguised as a traveller and a stranger to try if he can hear any talk of the man whom we have killed and endeavour to find out who he was and where he lived this 